This is Sam Robson here with Dr. Tom Frieden. Uh, today's date is January 6th, 2015, uh, and we're here in Atlanta, Georgia at CDC's Roybal campus. Uh, I'm interviewing Dr. Frieden as part of the CDC Ebola Oral History Project. We'll be discussing his specific experiences as a leader of CDC's response to the West African Ebola epidemic. Uh, so Dr. Frieden, uh, for the record, could you please state uh, your name and current position with CDC. Tom Frieden, Director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Great. Thank you. Um, and to start off with, I'm wondering if you can describe your efforts around Ebola and other similar diseases from the time that you assumed the directorship of CDC uh, up until 2013, uh, so before the West African epidemic. In uh, 2009, I became CDC director. We were immediately dealing with a very large outbreak of influenza, the H1N1 pandemic. That was a very challenging response. There was a lack of understanding on some parts that it was actually a severe uh, viral disease, for, particularly for kids. Many more kids died that year than in a normal flu year, uh, and there was a lot of disruption from it. That was a very challenging response because it didn't seem so severe to people, and yet it, it was a severe disease. That immediately showed us how important it was to look for diseases that would come from anywhere. Nobody expected that the pandemic would have emerged, as it appears to, from Mexico. And that was one early indication of the need to strengthen our global early warning systems. When uh, MERS emerged in the Middle East, no one would have predicted that MERS came from the Middle East. So around 2011, I began designing an initiative called the Global Health Security Initiative. And I pitched it to the White House. I pitched it to uh, Dennis McDonough, who was at that point, now he's the chief of staff for the president, then he was a deputy national security advisor, I believe. And uh, he was very supportive, but he said, basically, I was looking for $3 billion, a billion and a half for us at CDC, and a billion and a half for the Department of Defense, which they actually have, so they can use that as long as it's well aligned. And I was looking for a $3 billion investment over five years, and I talked with Dennis about it, and he said, Doc, look at the Defense Department's budget, and when you see their budget, think big. Think real big. So there was an interest and a commitment to the idea of global health security, but we didn't have resources for it. So we knew there were blind spots all over the world, and we knew that a blind spot anywhere is a risk everywhere. This did get some traction. So we had global health security. There was a, a cabinet coffee. This is something that Dennis arranged and others arranged. Uh, I don't think the president stopped in on this one, but many other cabinet members did to think about global health security as an issue that all of us as a government had to think about. And then in um, um, February of 2014, while Ebola was spreading, but before it was recognized, we launched the global health security agenda. That's something that, to launch something in the government, it's a year's production. So it was a lot of effort to get that to where it got to, and we were doing really a Hail Mary pass. We said we're going to help 30 countries with 4 billion people get better, better prepared, and we knew we needed a billion and a half dollars for it that we didn't have. Uh, but I've always said that every well-conceptualized, well-written proposal will ultimately get funded. And uh, that's what happened here. When we launched the Global Health Security Agenda, we actually mentioned Ebola and some of the op-eds and talking points as one of the things that we were worried about. But nobody expected anything like the Ebola epidemic that we experienced in 2014, 2015. Right. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I'm wondering if we can switch gears very quickly and talk a bit about your experience of the Ebola outbreak in Nigeria. There's no doubt in my mind that the moment of maximum terror was the cluster in Lagos. Uh, when we heard that a man with Ebola had gone to Lagos, this was absolutely horrifying. Uh, Lagos has a population roughly equal to all of West Africa combined, Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. The amount of travel in and out of Lagos is about 10 times higher than all of West Africa combined. And in Nigeria, where Lagos is a predominantly Muslim city that has connections with the Muslim north, uh, 
predominantly Muslim north of Kano, Borno, Yobe, where we'd been battling polio with tremendous challenges, uh, I knew immediately if Ebola gets out of control in Lagos, it's going to be out of control in Nigeria, it's going to be out of control in Africa, it's going to continue not just for months but for years, and it's going to kill people not just from Ebola but because Ebola is shutting down healthcare systems. So uh, this was J July 20th, 21st. We had just activated our emergency operations center on July 9th. And I basically grabbed people and I say, said, leave today or tomorrow. Bring the people over from within uh, Nigeria to the program. Throw everything you can at it. And um, we then sent about 10 people within the first two or three days. They were able to use the polio eradication infrastructure to address the challenges in Lagos. And I had to be on the phone regularly with the Minister of Health and with the governor of Lagos. And I ended up speaking with Governor Fashola multiple times a day for multiple days. The first conversation I had with him, I told him, because he's, he's a very highly thought of uh, leader in Nigeria. He had run Lagos, which is very difficult, very effectively for many years. Cleaned the city up, improved traffic, improved uh, garbage disposal, improved lots of things. I said, Governor Fashola, if you, don't control, uh, if you don't control Ebola in Lagos, the only thing you will ever be remembered for is the man who didn't control Ebola in Lagos. This is the single most important thing you will do in your time as governor. We will do everything to help you, but we need you to play a leadership role in it. And he did. He was very effective. So initially, the team got there, and it's all about organization. You organize an incident management system. So we replaced the ineffectual doctor with the deputy incident manager from the polio eradication program. He was very effective and he was running the programs very clearly. He had always been the deputy, so he kind of came into his own for this. A Nigerian, who we had trained, we supported. Our own staff uh, staffed each of the different units of the incident management system. And in short order, they identified 894 contacts. They did 19,000 home visits to measure temperatures. They did 43 Ebola tests. They identified 19 additional cases, um, but they stopped the outbreak. And during that time, we were so frustrated because they didn't have an Ebola treatment unit. And I said, you've got to set one up immediately, not fancy, right now. And there was a fight. It, they were going to use an old TB hospital. They were going to use this place, that place. Finally, Frank, uh, Frank Mahoney and others from CDC went there. They found an abandoned building that was part of a medical complex. And in 14 days, they built an Ebola treatment unit. It was functional, it was effective, it worked. But that slight delay meant that someone with Ebola left Lagos and went to Port Harcourt and started another cluster. That person didn't say they had Ebola. They ended up being treated privately by a doctor, and the doctor and his wife died. So they had to repeat that whole operation in Port Harcourt to stop Ebola there. But there's no doubt in my mind that if we hadn't stopped it in Lagos, it could have spread and changed from what has been a terrible epidemic to a true global catastrophe. And the other thing that was clear is, since this was happening in Lagos, and we'd already seen export to Senegal, it seemed that for every couple thousand cases, you had at least one export. And we knew we were going to have tens of thousands of cases. So we're, we're going to have dozens of exports of Ebola all over Africa and all over elsewhere. And that was just such a, a challenging situation to deal with. And the, the least understood aspect of this outbreak is how close to the precipice we were in that outbreak in Lagos. It, so it really wasn't just this theoretical what if. Like there, there was a very real possibility that it could have jumped. It jumped from Lagos to that other town in Nigeria. Uh, it was something that was could, could have been all over. Very tangible. It could have been all over. And the other thing that that really emphasized for us was the need to not isolate West Africa, despite this horrible risk, the idea that if we just turn our back on West Africa, we're going to see such a horrible explosion that spread elsewhere will be inevitable. Uh, someone at WHO used the unfortunate and incorrect phrase of, well, maybe it'll just burn out in West Africa. There's, there's no way a disease like Ebola burns out. A disease like measles can burn out because it, everyone gets it, and then it stops.
uh, but that's only in one community, and then it goes to the next place. So this idea that we had to both be careful about disease exports, but not isolate these countries, or it would make it impossible to stop Ebola there. Can you talk a little bit more about the difficulty of, of relaying that message uh, through, not just to the public, but to other government officials? It was really tough. I remember uh, I happened to have a reporter spending the day with me, and I had a phone conversation with Senator Mark Kirk, and uh, he was basically screaming at me, um, saying that you know I was being totally irresponsible, and I was using every argument I had, and uh, and he, I hung up the phone, and and the reporter asked me, did that work? And I said it was like a ping pong ball against a metal safe, just no impact whatsoever. I, I then had an interesting conversation with the president about this. Uh, and this is one of the many meetings I had where I was the guy on the video conference and everyone else was in the room because I had to stay here you know, running things and I couldn't be there with cabinet meetings that I was part of. So I, I ended up being a disembodied uh, uh, a screen a lot with the president. But in this meeting, I remember very specifically, we had begun the process of establishing a closed loop. So we were checking people when they left for fever. We were getting the information of people who were coming into the U.S., Customs and Border Protection and Department of Homeland Security very creatively funneled people to five airports, which made it much easier. And so we could track people when they were in. So if they got sick, they would rapidly be isolated and cared for as safely as possible. And I, I said, uh, we, t we were discussing this because we, we knew that if we cut commercial travel, if we cut these countries off, it would be impossible to control the outbreaks and the possibility of real social unrest in the countries making any disease control effort uh, impossible was there. In fact, I had a conversation with Congressman Tim Murphy in which I said, Congressman Mur Murphy, these are recently elected democratic governments. If they fall, we have dictatorships and war, believe, believe me, I've tried to control disease in the midst of war, it's almost impossible. Well, he turned that around in a hearing and said, you're coddling dictators. And so uh, it really showed how difficult it was to try to make this point clearly uh, to the public and politicians. And we had this active monitoring system that was a closed loop so we could track people. And um, uh, this issue came up because with the president, we were the president stood firm that we're not going to cut these countries off, we're not going to do a travel ban, and there were calls for that from Congress, and it would have undermined our ability to stop the outbreak. So uh, with this uh, meeting, I s they asked how it was going, and I said, Mr. President, I've been making this argument that unless we stop it there, we can't protect people here, and I'm getting absolutely nowhere with that argument. But there's another argument we can use, which is that if we cut off travel officially, people will travel unofficially, and then this closed loose loop system we have of monitoring people actively when they arrive uh, will lose, and it will increase risk for that reason. So it's the idea of um, instead of this longer-term concern, well, if it gets really bad there, it'll be worse here, that's a long-term thing, versus a short-term thing, which is tomorrow, if we stop this, we'll lose what we can do tracking people. And the president said, I don't remember his exact words, but it was something very much like this, well, uh, I may not know a lot about epidemiology, but I do know a lot about politics. And that latter argument is the only one you're going to get people to uh, to buy into. And so that's what we did. They're both accurate. They're, they're, it's not dishonest to use either of them. And in one of the very contentious hearings we had in the House, uh, I, I uh, kind of spelled out that uh, second argument of uh, having to maintain this closed loop system. And one of the congressmen asked a very good question. He says, well, can you calculate how many people would uh, come in illicitly? That would be a very small number versus how many people are coming in now who you might not diagnose promptly? That was a good question, but fortunately it didn't carry the day. And between the work that we did and the president did and Ron Klain did, we were able to not have uh, requirements for travel bans that would have been counterproductive and would have increased the risk to Americans. Absolutely. Can you talk a little more about uh, the <laughs> history of the decision to um, track travelers in the United States from West Africa, uh, what all went into that, some of the discussions that you had? Yeah, I don't remember the, the exact dates, but roughly uh, it went like this. 
um, we knew we had to reduce the risk. So the first thing we did was to set up exit screening in West Africa on a scale that had never been done before. And uh, when we looked hard at the data, we realized that the thermal scanners, these machines like x-ray machines you walk through, were not going to work. They had false positives and false negatives. If you're wearing a headscarf, for example, it won't get your temperature. And it will give false positives if you're a little sweaty or otherwise. So although they're used in a few countries around the world, that wasn't the right technology. So first, we had to look at the different technologies. And Dr. Nikki Pesek did a great job rigorously evaluating them. And that's what we do best at CDC. We rigorously evaluate the science, and we realized that these these uh, infrared scanners that look a little like guns, uh, you can hold it near someone's head, take a temperature, they were accurate and they were reliable. And because of that, we put them in for all the people leaving. More than a half a million people leaving affected countries got screened with these, and we supervised to make sure the procedures were right. Initially, it was pretty rough. In fact, the first time I came back from West Africa, um, it w I was tested three times, once accurately by the people we trained, but then twice by other people, including the airline itself, which wrote on my boarding pass what my temperature was, which was 32.3 degrees centigrade, which would have been dead. <laughs> uh, so there were some, uh, you know, roughnesses of doing it, though ultimately we did that well. But then uh, we realized, I guess after Mr. Duncan was diagnosed here, that we had to have a way of tracking people so that the moment they got fever, we could safely shepherd them to a place where they could be cared for safely. And I thought to myself, oh, I know this. This is basically the kind of work I did in tuberculosis control, where you identify patients and you track them every day. Um, and so this idea of having a care package and including a thermometer in it. We rapidly realized that people didn't, a third of the people didn't have phones that worked in this country. A lot cheaper to give people a phone than to spend thousands of dollars trying to find them when they're not there. Ch phones are cheap. So this was really, I think, uh, an idea that I had to, to establish a closed loop system and make sure that we could do something that was a reasonable thing to do that was a middle ground between trying to stop all travel and doing nothing and did have a value because we found a lot of malaria so we could at least get people promptly treated for malaria and we could also uh, resist the calls for a travel ban. Right, absolutely. Uh, can you talk, I've recently had the opportunity to talk a bit with uh, uh, Dr. Jordan Tapero and, or Tapero, excuse me, and Dr. Marty Setrin. Can you talk about working with them on the whole, on that system? This has been the largest mobilization in CDC history. About one out of every five CDC staff has worked in the Ebola response. At the peak, we had roughly 10% of our professional staff working on it. We've had 1,400 people go to West Africa, spending more than 70,000 work days there. Uh, some of the people who impressed me so much were people like Tara Seeley, who ran the lab in Sierra Leone. That lab operated, I believe, for 421 days without a break. It did more than 25,000 Ebola tests. It implemented robotics in the field to do high throughput testing. No one had ever done 200 Ebola tests a day before. These are not simple tests to do. And it did it all in, in, in great, uh, a great setting. I remember meeting Tara for the first time when I did a walkthrough of the viral special pathogens branch uh, in April and May. Um, this is before the big explosion. She was just heading over there to, uh, to set up a mobile lab. And uh, when I met her, her screensaver on her computer was a picture of her baby. And she was leaving her baby. I think the uh, baby was about 18 months at that time, the first time she had been away. She was going for a month. And she had her suitcase there. It was huge. It looked like one of those old trunks. It was the mobile lab. That's what she was going with. Um, and uh, she went on multiple occasions. I remember speaking with her Thanksgiving Day 2014 because she was there and I wanted to give best wishes to the team. She was there again, I think, on Christmas Day this year. And uh, that team did phenomenal work. We also had people like Kim Lindblade. Kim, uh, who was deploying from uh, Thailand, ended up having important roles in all three countries. Uh, she got to, uh, I think, um, Liberia, Iberia first, and I met her there where she had helped in one area set up an effective contact tracing program. She then was in uh, Sierra Leone, and we had a real problem with Sierra Leone. Um, the President Coroma insisted on mandatory quarantine of contacts. 
it was a mistake. It was a serious mistake. And it resulted in contacts going underground, in severe hardship for patients and contacts, and in my view, without a doubt, extended the outbreak by at least three to six months. Now, as a footnote here, I wish we had uh, pushed back harder against that, and one of the reasons we didn't was this construct from the White House that the British owned Sierra Leone, we owned Liberia, and the French owned Guinea. It never had any, real, any relation to reality in the field, but it undermined our ability to really play the lead role we should have been playing in Sierra Leone on policy issues, because the British were, since it was militarized, they didn't really get that that was the wrong approach. Anyway, what, since we couldn't get that changed, what Kim and Oliver Morgan decided was they would um, create a voluntary quarantine facility, or VQF, and they would invite people from their homes voluntarily into that quarantine facility. That was important for people because what Karoma had ordered is that there would be a policeman outside your home if you were a contact. And that was immediately very stigmatizing. So it was quite popular with contacts to come into the voluntary quarantine facility. And we could take their temperature more reliably. We could give them enough food. It was that my staff assured me any of us would be happy staying here. It was a nice place for people. It wasn't a prison. Um, and so that was a very positive thing that she created and established there. And, and definitely tamped down transmission in Sierra Leone. She then worked in Guinea, and she did some really perceptive analyses. And we, I wish we had done more of this type of work. It's what CDC does best. She looked and she found, first off, that most transmission was related to burial. And so burial was causing a lot of the transmission. In fact, let me say that differently. The patients who died were much more likely to transmit than the patients who didn't die. It was about a five to one ratio. So that's important. That had immediate practical implications. That means if I'm doing contact follow-up of a, a patient who died, I have a high risk contact here and I have to make sure I've got them all. The second finding she identified was even more important. It was that, that Guinea had identified what were safe burials and what were unsafe burials. Well, there was no difference in secondary cases between safe burials and unsafe burials because as the burial teams had been telling us forever, the patients are washing the bodies before they call the burial team. So that really emphasized the need to get people into the Ebola treatment units, that safe burial wouldn't be enough since it wasn't really safe burial. So Kim had this impact in all three countries, and Frank Mahoney deserves a tremendous amount of credit. He was there in Lagos, core to getting the response through. He was there in Liberia in September when everyone was just freaking out, and Frank just focused and uh, said, we're going to do micro planning exercises with every county. And they called in over the course of two weekends, every county leadership team, the elected officials, the medical people, others, and they said, all right, here's how Ebola spreads, here's what you got to do. Now, let's do a micro planning exercise, which is something he learned from polio, uh, on where are you going to put patients before we build an ETU where are you going to put contacts and how are you going to do it? And they see, saw all sorts of activities happening, some of them not good, some of them kind of vigilantism uh, against patients or contacts, some of them very good, supporting patients and contacts. But I, I believe that that community action, which was importantly triggered and supported by what Frank did, is the most important thing that turned the tide on the outbreak. And Frank reminded me of two things that I said uh, in my interactions with him early on when things were just awful, I said, look, people aren't stupid. When they see people dying, they're going to stop touching people who have died from Ebola. And that's partly what happened. The second thing that uh, Frank did is when we had the last outbreak in uh, Liberia, this was uh, a, a St. Paul Bridge cluster, and this was tough. This was really tough. So there's a movie about CDC from the 1950s called Panic in the Streets. And in that movie, the EIS officer, I'm going to spoil it for you, but in this movie, the EIS officer uh, is uh, there in, uh, 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 ironically, New Orleans, which is where Frank did his EIS program. But the EIS officer is called in because a, a man is shot and dies. And the assumption is that it's a murder. But the medical examiner says this man was not killed by the murder. He has pneumonic plague, and he was shot at point-blank range. 
and whoever shot him has now been exposed to plague. Unless we find who shot him and get that man isolated, there's gonna be a plague outbreak in New Orleans. Well, the St. Paul Bridge Cluster, one of their index cases, was a man who was stabbed in the back with a knife and died, except he didn't die from the stab. He died because he has Ebo Ebola. And it was only because all of the te deaths were tested for Ebola that they knew that. So they had to find the guy who stabbed him for the same reason, because there was blood all over the place. And this St. Paul Bridge Cluster occurred in a, uh, 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 a very marginalized community, a uh, lot of criminal activity, a lot of drug use, and um, uh, at one point uh, on the regular calls, I had calls every Saturday with every country for well over a year. On one of those calls, Frank was in Liberia, referred to him as the criminals, and I stopped him. I said, you, you can't refer to them that way. They're human beings. Uh, we've got to treat patients as VIPs, which is what I said the first time I had been there a year earlier. So they began calling them VIPs, and they made something like a voluntary quarantine facility for them. They brought them huge amounts of food. They played movies for them. And it was really the ability to engage each community that led to the ability to stop Ebola. Right, absolutely. Uh, I want to go back to something that you had said about the division of the kind of division of labor between uh, medical humanitarian countries, you know, Britain with Sierra Leone and France with Guinea and uh, U.S. with Liberia. Can you just actually give me a history of your uh, interactions with other uh, governments involved in the humanitarian response? Early on, when the CDC model came out, we used that horrific idea of what would happen if we did nothing to galvanize action in the U.S. government. And then I used it in a session at the United Nations with uh, dozens and dozens of countries there to galvanize global action on Ebola and other areas. And we wanted them to stop doing harm, to stop banning people, because we had local staff from other parts of Africa who couldn't respond because they wouldn't be able to go back. Um, the, uh, the British government did do an excellent job of running the response well. They put substantial resources into it. Our largest contingent was always in Sierra Leone because that was where the biggest challenges were. And um, that was the case for well over a year. We had more people in Sierra Leone than either of the other countries. And we were hamstrung a little bit by this idea that the Brits were in the lead, but we were able to generally work closely with them. The fact that they had militarized this did change some of the approach that they used. Guinea was a very different story. We really had challenges in Guinea. We were never able to field the kind of team, the size and depth of team we needed to, to implement as effectively as possible. And frankly, and this is immodest on behalf of CDC, I think the reason it took longer to stop it in Guinea is that we had fewer people there. Because CDC brings a level of quality that's just unparalleled in the world. But what was so encouraging about CDC activities in Guinea is that uh, when we put out a call for French epidemiologists, the French didn't provide anyone. In fact, they had someone there the whole time who was kind of uh, professorial and lecturing and smart but didn't really do anything practically. Um, the Canadians really came forward. They said, we've never deployed like this before, we've never done global work before, but we're willing. And they provided us with terrific staff, uh, four or five at any one time, and that's continuing through March of 2016 at least. And they had a great experience with it, we did. They came down here to Atlanta to learn, and then they deployed with us, they traveled in our vehicles, they were part of our team, and we, they ended up being team leads for many of the areas that we were working in. The second wonderful thing was the Congolese the epidemiologists we had trained from the Democratic Republic of Congo. They were there, they're francophone, they're from the rough region, they had a sense of it, and they did a terrific job. So I, uh, we, they ha we've had 10 of them there at all times. I went to DRC for the express purpose of first thanking them for being such an important part of the response, and second saying, couldn't we do more in DRC if you've been so effective there? So we're still trying to follow up on that. That's great. Um, switching gears uh, just a bit, uh, I know that you were very active asking the White House to appoint someone uh, to be essentially an Ebola czar to uh, organize the general U.S. Ebola response. Can you expand a, a little bit more on, on that and in, and in your communication with the White House in general? This was a really challenging response. You had stuff within the U.S. going on, uh, hospitals, um, transport, travel, uh, 
You had stuff going on globally in West Africa and globally. You had the State Department. Uh, you had the Defense Department. You had lots of stuff going on. So from at least um, August, I had been pleading with the White House to appoint a czar because we were getting too many questions and uh, this organization and how the response was. Um, on, I went because I just felt I had to see it myself. I went in late August of 2014, partly because Kevin DeCock, who's one of the most experienced, seasoned public health, global health experts we have, who spent a lifetime in Africa, was clearly just imbalanced by the experience he had had in Liberia. It was just so overwhelming. He had never seen anything like it. And I felt, I've got to go and see what can be done. It was, a, it was a productive trip. I went with the goal of establishing incident management systems with an incident manager in each of the three countries. Uh, I was able to do that in two of the three. In, in Sierra Leone, I didn't have enough time. I've always felt if I had just had another day there, maybe I would have been able to get uh, a much better doctor from within the country to run it so it would be from a medical rather than a military perspective. But uh, that was successful. Uh, I got back and I heard that the president wanted to speak with me. I just landed. Uh, so I got back around 1 p.m. on a holiday. Uh, I guess it was uh, Labor Day of 2014, September 1st or 2nd. And uh, I was speaking to the president at 4 or 5. And um, so I was getting my thoughts together. I had written a, a trip report. I always do trip reports of what, what did I find, what do I recommend. And that trip report, I, I look back at it and it's just so frustrating. I said, this has to be done in weeks, this has to be done in days, this has to be done in, within a month. And, and it took a year to do many of those things. So the speed with which things were moving was very slow. And we had kind of a false start with the Department of Defense. Uh, folks within uh, DOD told us, we can do anything. And we had, I'm afraid, magical thinking about what DOD could do. Uh, in July, July of 2014, I asked the DOD to build 300 beds, 100 in each country, and that would have been enough. But uh, then they said, well, to do that, we have to go through the DART, which is USAID. We have to activate the DART. You have to specify things. And we just basically got jerked around. I wasn't specific enough to say, what I mean is build and staff and have them up and running within 30 days. Ultimately, the, the fastest thing they could do, they said, was in three months build 25 beds. I said, take it, do it, and use it for healthcare workers. But uh, the, the day I got back from West Africa for my first trip, I talked with President Obama, and I said, we, we need to move very fast. The only group that can move this, fa this fast is the Defense Department. He said, well, you know, they're busy with a lot of other things now. Uh, but ultimately, he came down here just two weeks later, September 16th, and made an announcement that all of government would be involved, the Defense Department would be involved, though not in a direct care role. Um, and uh, that September 16th announcement was very important. In fact, uh, the U.S. Ambassador to Liberia, Deb Malik, told me that that was the turning point for Liberia. Once the president said, we're in, there was hope again, and they were able to really get people to focus on the things that they needed to do to stop the outbreak. Um, when the cases in Dallas happened, um, it, was, it was a mess. We uh, had to rapidly change our infection control guidance. We um, ha had unfortunately not prevented the second nurse from flying back from Ohio, which uh, in retrospect, knowing what we knew then, we should have done. That's something that we should have done differently. Um, the, the personal protective equipment recommendations, that's 2020 hindsight. We had seen many patients before. We hadn't counted on the fact that Mr. Duncan would have two and a half gallons a day of diarrhea. We hadn't realized how intense the contact can be between U.S. nurses and patients compared to Africa. And I hadn't remembered what my father told me, which is when you see how other doctors practice medicine, you realize how resilient the human body is. There are a lot of mistakes in healthcare. And um, I myself got infected with TB working in a tuberculosis clinic. So infection control clearly needs to be better. But the, when all of this was happening, uh, and it was happening a month before the midterm elections. It was the lead story in the news. It was absolutely everywhere. Um, uh, and I think at that point, the White House agreed to appoint Ron Klain, who did an excellent job as coordinator. 
Uh, it was seen by some as a diss to me or CDC, and it wasn't. It was what we had wanted and needed to run this more effectively. And uh, there was criticism that Ron doesn't have knowledge of, of health, and Ron was very clear. I'm not making any technical decisions. I'm letting the technical people do that, but I'm making it easier. In his farewell event, I went there, I said, when Ron became director, before he became Ebola coordinator, uh, getting technical documents cleared through the interagency process was a long and painful experience, and after he arrived, it was no longer long. Can you talk just a little bit more about uh, your relationship with Ron Klain um, and how that evolved after he was appointed? Just one minute. I want to go back to something about uh, Lagos for a minute yeah, please. Uh, afterwards, but let me... Um, uh, talk about Ron and the White House. Um, when the president was here on September 16th, he met with all of our leadership, and he referred to the call two weeks earlier and said, you know, Dr. Friedman was, I think he used the word, uh, a bit agitated on that call, and I was. Uh, it was really uh, mind-boggling. I've worked in war zones. I've done uh, work after earthquakes and hurricanes. Uh, I've seen starvation, uh, but I had never seen anything like I saw in West Africa. Um, on the one hand, it could look kind of normal. You drive through the streets, people are walking around, shops are open. On the other hand, you look below the surface, and uh, I went to the uh, Elwa treatment facility that uh, Doctors Without Borders, MSF, was running. They had 120 patients and one doctor. They had 60 corpses that they couldn't even remove. There were two people who had died that morning. They couldn't move the dead bodies out because they didn't have enough people to suit in and move them out. It's not easy. And so you have people desperately ill next to someone who's died who can't be removed. That's, that's a, a, just an apocalyptic kind of experience. It, I, I said in an email, which apparently made it to the president, it's, it's like scenes from Dante. Um, and uh, the, the, uh, from day one, President Obama was very forward-leaning on this. He understood it. Uh, he was totally committed. He came down on the right side of all of the key decisions on issues of uh, quarantine and travel bans and getting resources and including, including global health security in the efforts. Other people didn't want to include that in the funding request, but he insisted and it was in. And Ron Klain was very effective at shepherding that through Congress. Uh, he, Congress said, well, why should we do that? He says, well, you, do you want to be the person we say? Uh, he vetoed, he, he didn't support it, and now we have Ebola there. So Ron was very effective in getting that through Congress, and he was very effective at coordinating uh, different people's activities so that we had less churn and more focus on getting things done. His focus was more U.S. than, than West Africa, but, uh, but it, was, it was helpful to have him there. Absolutely. And can you talk about, um, so after the kind of collaboration between uh, CDC and uh, the U.S. military was brokered in West Africa, how that uh, relationship kind of evolved in, in, in your role in communicating with uh, generals and other people in the military? The, the approach with DOD was to work through USAID. USAID through AFTA, the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, had developed a MITAM process by which requests could be made of the military. Uh, I would say that that process didn't work very well for us. It, it, was, it was indirect. So I tell somebody else, they tell somebody else, they tell somebody else, and then they ask if it's this, if it's this, if, if it's this. And I guess maybe my expectations were unrealistic. Uh, but the kind of things that needed to be done in the time frame that they needed to be done was problematic. And uh, people like Frank Mahoney can talk about that in more detail, that it ended up being uh, often what we need is small and quick. And we ended up with a, a large aircraft, literally aircraft carriers rather than uh, small, quick things. Um, that said, the military's presence there was extremely important. Uh, they did good things. They trained people. They did important logistics work, bringing things in. They built the Ebola treatment units. Uh, they ran laboratories, which were crucially important. But the most important thing the military did was to give hope. They were a hope multiplier in West Africa. And that was really, really important, that people knew that we weren't going to abandon these countries. Absolutely. About 10 minutes. About 10 minutes? Okay. I want to just double back to the Lagos experience, because. Yeah. At the height of the Lagos outbreak, 
I had a trip planned to rural Kentucky with Hal Rogers, who is the chair of the House Appropriations Committee, a good guy and very committed to an issue that's very high priority for us, which is reversing the epidemic of opioid overdose. And I debated, do I cancel this trip? Because, and he said, you can cancel, no, no need, but no need for you to come, because I know what you're doing is really important. I said, that's okay, I'm, I'll be in phone contact with my staff all day. If you don't mind, I'll just have to step out a lot. And so uh, I went with a satellite phone and multiple other phones. We were traveling this rural hollers of, uh, of rural Kentucky. Uh, maybe I said Tennessee earlier. It was rural Kentucky. And um, I, I'd actually been there before. It's Pikesville. I had my first job out of college was doing work for the Appalachian Student Health Coalition. I'd been there then, so they were surprised I had actually been in their, village, their community before uh, 32 years or something like that earlier. But um, I was trying to reach Governor Fashola and the Minister of Health, and I was often out of cell phone contact, and I had the satellite phone, and it was out of satellite phone contact. So the irony was, here I was in the U.S., and the same thing that was so challenging to us in Africa, we didn't have cell phone coverage, was a problem here at that moment for me. Uh, but I was able to reach Governor Fashola repeatedly, and we had multiple conversations each day, and we were able to get the response working very effectively. Absolutely. Um, I'm wondering if you can tell me a bit about, and I know we have limited time left, um, your work with private companies like UPS and like uh, drug manufacturers. The private sector was terrific. They came forward and they said, how can we help? Uh, we've got the CDC Foundation. The CDC Foundation is our interface with the private sector. Very early on, we were desperately short of cash. We, we didn't have money to send people there. We didn't have money for travel. Practically couldn't buy the plane ticket to get people there. So early on, the Gates Foundation gave us, I think, $3 million and $5 million to just get us started. Mark Zuckerberg came forward and gave us $25 million. That was crucially important. Uh, Paul Allen from the Paul Allen Foundation gave us $18 million to support emergency operations centers and other activities there. Ultimately, the CDC Foundation raised about $56 million here, and it was really important to have that flexibility and speed that you don't always have within the government. Um, Frank Mahoney made a point that is very important, that a lot of times uh, a rapid action can head off a need for much bigger things. So it may be that I need $400 to rent a hall to have a training tomorrow. And I need to be able to do that now. And that kind of rapid response dollars is very hard to get. And we did some of that through the CDC Foundation. Uh, ultimately, we ended up with a, a, a rapid response fund that we had private entities through. UPS has been a wonderful partner for CDC for many, many years. And what was clear is that we needed transport in West Africa. Uh, and there are no overnight mail services. And UPS doesn't have services there. So the CDC Foundation said, what do you need most? We need Jeeps and motorcycles, hundreds of them. And now you need to get them there. So uh, the UPS actually got a plane and moved the stuff into West Africa and a boat, other stuff there. So, and those vehicles were really important in the response. And there were many other areas in which the private sector was very important in the response. How do, how do we know and measure CDC's effectiveness in West Africa and, yeah? Well, first, success is pretty straightforward in one way, sure. zero cases. Right. And as of January 2016, that's where we are now. We don't anticipate that we'll always have zero cases, but we do expect that there will never be widespread transmission as there was in 2014 and 2015. And that, I think, is very important. But that would be insufficient as progress. What we really need as progress is the global health security work, making sure that these countries and countries throughout the world have systems to find, stop, and prevent health threats as soon as they emerge, whether they're Ebola or a tick-borne illness or measles or another serious health problem. This is core public health. This is about finding a problem when it first emerges, responding rapidly, and preventing wherever that's possible. Well, I had wanted to ask a bit about the history of the, de uh, the decision to um, create these long-term country offices in the three worst-hit countries. Uh, we realized early on that this was going to be a long response. In fact, I remember the president calling me. I was in the emergency operations center. I got a call from the White House, didn't know who it was going to be, stepped into the incident manager's office, shooed everyone else out. There was the president 
uh, a few days after he had been here, asking how things are going, what more he could do. Another time in the Oval Office, he said to me, quote, you're the man, you got to tell us what you need. The whole U.S. government is behind you to do this. Um, but it was, it's hard to identify what can you do because I said, Mr. President, you're, you're doing all the right things, but this is going to take many, many months. It's so far out of control. It's going to take so long. And we realized that for the Ebola response, success required something very close to perfection. Success required being able to find every case promptly, every contact, every contact with a fever, every interaction with a, a person with fever that might be uh, Ebola. And we estimate that there are two million febrile episodes each month in West Africa, and then every burial being safe. So, so difficult to get that level of quality. Very early on, someone said to me on one of the phone calls, uh, these countries in West Africa make Uganda look like Switzerland. And that difference is, is a real challenge. Going forward, what we've got to do is have high quality, rapid, practical, sustained systems to find and stop health threats wherever they emerge. Absolutely. And can you talk a bit about uh, the conversations you must have had with leaders in Liberia and uh, Sierra Leone and Guinea uh, about the, the long-term CDC presence? I spent a lot of time with each of the three presidents, uh, starting with uh, President Sirleaf Johnson. Uh, the first time I was there, I had to be very blunt with her in a private meeting, saying, this is going to get a lot worse. It's going to get a lot worse before it gets better, but we will stay here. We will be here until it's over. And I gave each of the three presidents that as my commitment, and we've kept that commitment. We realized early on that one of the biggest barriers to responding in West Africa was the lack of trained staff here. And so what we did for the staff here, uh, Stuart Nichol and others realized that there was only one course to learn how to treat Ebola. It was in Europe. It was run by MSF. It was high quality. Let's replicate that here. And uh, we were able, within a relatively short time to replicate that. More than 500 healthcare workers went through it, and that resulted in much safer care in West Africa. We also had to strengthen the system here. So even before the first case in the U.S. was diagnosed, we had been scaling up the, um, the LRN, the Laboratory Response Network, for Ebola tests around the country. These are Ebola tests that uh, both CDC and U.S. AMRID have developed, and they're accurate. Um, and having those available meant that patients could be diagnosed in hours instead of days. So we had the laboratory network there, and then once we went to the system of having designated hospitals, we established teams to go out to each of the hospitals and work with them on really getting ready. And hospitals put a lot into this. They spent a lot of money, they had a lot of focus, sometimes they did excessive or unnecessary things, but there was a real focus. The, it's very hard for people who didn't live through this to understand just how much uh, panic there was about Ebola at the peak of it, with hospitals terrified and the, the, the kind of risk. That's why, for me, it was so challenging. You had to modulate. On the one hand, to say, this is not going to be a big outbreak in the U.S. It's just not going to happen. I used the quotation in the news, it's not in the cards. The way it spreads is unsafe care and unsafe burial. And we can control both of those things than the U.S. So yes, we have to be really careful. Yes, we have to invest and focus, but um, it's not going to be a big outbreak here. Even the day I announced Mr. Duncan's diagnosis, I said there may well be additional cases, meaning in healthcare workers or family members. Um, but when there were cases in the nurses, it just got ratcheted up the next level. At the same time, telling people, you're not going to get Ebola here, saying it is a terrible problem in West Africa, and we have to respond effectively there, and we have to not um, isolate these countries, or we will be at higher risk. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Sound good? I think it'll give us a chance to think a little bit about what to circle back to for the yeah. next.